It's a fact that some fly fishers are more successful than others. There's even an old saying about it. 90% of fish are caught by 10% of the anglers. However, it's dead easy to improve your catch rate by having three essential skills. First, have at least some understanding of what trout and grayling really eat and where they find that food. Second, tie flies that are good copies of those food items. And third, and probably most important of all, match the tactics to the conditions. This means understanding where the fish are lying and presenting the artificial convincingly. This is what these videos are all about. Approximately 80% of what trout and grayling eat is taken off or very near the stream bed. And a great proportion of that food is caddis larva. This is what makes check nymphing one of the most effective methods of fly fishing. It's quite simply an essential skill for any fly fisherman. However, before we go off and fish, let's have a dig around on the stream bed and find out what's down there for the fish to eat. It's dead easy to find what's in your stream. All you do is find a nice stone that you can turn over, roll your sleeve up, get ready for the thermal shock, Stick your hand in, turn the stone over. Just look here what I've found. Hydrocyclic lava, a big one. Look at its black thorax. There's a pupil shelter. There'll be a pupa in here, probably of the Rhyacophila caddis. I'll just turn it over. Oh no, it's a hydrocyclic lava. Pupil case of a hydrocyclic lava. There it is, look, backing away. There's another pupil shelter that's finished with. There's the cocoon that hasn't hatched. There's a maturing pupa inside there. Lots and lots of tiny caddis pupa there. This case caddis has decided to snuggle up at the side of this one. And there's the pupa inside there, look. You can just see it. And if you multiply what's on here by the number of stones on the stream bed, you're gonna get literally billions and billions of insects. Remember though, put the stone back carefully, the right way down, someone lives under there. Let's leave entomology for a while and look at a general pattern that imitates a whole range of larva, bugs, and even a shrimp, the Czech nymph. Czech nymphs are popular. They've been popular now for about, oh, probably four years. That's rather a large one. That's probably on a size six. Eights, tens, and twelves are the most used sizes. Colours can vary quite considerably. You can have tan, pale yellow, greenish coloured olives, with or without the hot spot in the thoracic region. Doesn't really matter. The basic thing is, you, as you can see, it's tied on a curved grub hook. And the paramount thing about a check nymph is it's got to be slim. So don't go laying on too many turns of lead. Once down and once back up with the lead is absolutely sufficient. So. I've got a size 10 Partridge K4A in the vise and I'm going to lead it. Now, traditionally, the, uh, the Czechs use square lead, but what I've found is that if you use this, this uh, sticky back lead foil, you get exactly the same results. And also, it makes a nice slim underbody. So I'm taking off a strip of lead about a millimetre and a half wide. And scissor skill is something that you will need to learn. You've got to be able to make nice long straight cuts with all fly tying. It's amazing how many people cannot cut materials to a given width. And then obviously I've got to peel the sticky back off. So you need to be able to just pierce it with your scissors and just separate the plastic back in. There we go. And now on with my lead. Start fairly well around the bend touch down, make contact. After about three wraps, you can let go of the tag end and just wind hand over hand. You can nip the tag off now, but in turns, don't overlap. Come up to about one width short of the eye, come back over yourself, stretch it slightly, pull tight, and now come back. Again, but in turns, come along, come along. Don't go quite to the end, I stop short at the end, just so you get a slight taper at the back end. So that's the that's the leading. And now on with the tying thread. I'm using this Moser Power Silk, which is 
a very very strong thread rated as being unbreakable knock off my waist tag and then the next material to go in is the all important nylon mono rib I'm using four pound mono my dentist is never pleased when he sees me doing this on with your mono rib it's better actually if you just nick it in your teeth just so that you get little depressions that helps it to grip now take your tying thread well round the bend and then the next thing to go in is your under rib the under rib can be um, any material really fine gold wire, medium gold wire fine flat pearly fine flat silver there's no hard and fast rule I'm doing this with fine flat gold So give yourself sufficient, don't be skinny, give yourself about uh, six or seven inches of ribbon material. Catch that in. And now try to keep all your thread turns now to a minimum. And the final thing to go in is your all important shell back. That's the tatty remains of an original Czech surgical glove. Any surgical glove is fine. What I would recommend is that you use surgical gloves rather than the sheet latex that you buy or latex that's that's now available under the heading of nymph skin the reason is this is very thin in, in section and this is ideal so you look for a glove that's this this pale um, neutral colour not not these white surgical gloves they're no good it wants to be this pale neutral uh, sort of natural latex colour so I'm going to take off a strip about four millimetres wide say three sixteenths and you won't want a long piece because it's going to be stretched. So there's me, there's my piece of translucent latex. I'll just cut a slight angle in the one end as a tying in tag. And now this has got a shiny side and a dull side. I'm going to tie it in with the shiny side uppermost. Remember, this is going to be folded back over. So I'm tying it in with the shiny side uppermost so that my finished fly will have the dull side uppermost so I touch this down and press down with my thumbnail there just as I've got a nice tiny in tag and now once you've got it in position you can simply stretch the latex and make sure that you've got a very very good connection any remains of tag you can just go around with your blade and just clean it up Right, for dubbing, again there's no hard and fast rule. You can use a variety of colours. I'm going to use a pale creamy olive colour. I'm mixing a little bit of, of cream and pale olive. I'll just do a, a finger mix. Just mix them together. Now, knock that on. And you want this dubbing to be very, very sparse. So no pills, no lumps and bumps, shred, shred it out with your th thumbnail and give yourself a nice long spindle of dubbing because this fly will fairly eat dubbing. Just tighten it in, spread it along. And now you're ready to wind on. Just lose the first bit of undubbed thread by dancing on the spot. Try to keep it even come up with this initial dubbing a good two thirds even three quarters now some check nymphs at this point have a little hot spot on the abdomen that's your choice if you don't want to put the hot spot leave it out i'm not sure how much uh, killing power it adds to the fly but if you're going to put a hot spot in i use this finesse orange in the masterclass range and all you want is a mere whisper you just want about one one and a half turns no more so just a tiny pinch of of nice bright orange just to make a little band in the center so now from your hair's mask just shred out some nice spiky guard hairs the spikier the better
and now make a little shaggy thorax. And at that point, I'll just drop on a half inch or a couple of whips. Follow that now with your metallic rib. Don't make too many ribs, only about, well, probably seven up this, the length of the f entire fly. So keep the ribs fairly wide spaced. And go right through the thoracic area as well till you get to the head whereupon you tie off. Trim off the waist. Just drop another couple of whips on there. Just so that you don't lose tension. Pull over your shell back, the piece of surgical glove. Now the trick is to keep this dead central. You don't want it to drift to one side or the other. So give it a nice stretch. Shorten your working thread. Keep that taut. Drop over a softish wrap. And then tighten down. And again, and again, and again. Now just in the interest, again, of security, I'll drop a couple of whips on there. Just check that your shell back is central. And now, finally, pick up your mono rib. I try to drop them in the centre of your metallic ribs, your gold rib. And with each turn, I pull quite tight, support the hook, and go in between. Try to keep the spacing even. I'm just not quite even there. Try to keep your spacing even. Make sure that shell back doesn't get pulled over too much to one side. And come along. Pull in each time. Tie this nylon mono down very securely. It's a slippery medium. Your tying thread is also slippery. So make sure you get several turns over it. The last thing you want is for this to unravel. And that's why I like using power silk because I can really lay onto it with loads and loads of pressure. And as I'm doing this, I'm building up a short head. Power silk, by the way, when it tightens down, it's only as fine as a 10 oak thread, so it's very, very fine. Now you can risk snipping off your rib. You could always do a little overlap if you wanted, but I find if I've made if I've made about eight turns with power silk, it's not going to slip. And then I finally take hold of the excess shell back, just lift it away from the eye, stretch it slightly, search with my blade, nick it, nick and tear, nick and tear, nick and tear, nick. And off she comes. And then on with the standard two finger whip finish. And I'm just making a little conical head now with each wrap, working backwards towards my finger and thumb of my right hand. Pull through, pull tight, trim off. One last thing now, just look at the shell back, check whereabouts it is. If it's slightly to one side, you can always cheat a little bit and roll it backwards. So you can roll it over to centralise it. And then finally, with a brown pen, a brown marker pen, I just tint the back. Just wipe this on. Only on the latex, not on the dubbing. And then I just rub the excess ink off, which deposits it more or less all in the rib parts, so it enhances the rib. And that's, if you like, that's it. That's a standard check nymph. We're going to tie the Raya larva. 
which is probably one of my all-time favourite uh, deep nymphs, if you like, or deep bugs. It's perfect for check nymphing. I've probably had more fish on this than any of my other larva or bugs. But don't go by the shade of green when you're trying to identify ryak larva. Look for the deep segmented abdomen and the pairs of hairy gills down all the segments. If you see these and the segments, it's a dead giveaway. It's called the green rockworm in America. Most freestone streams throughout the world have huge populations of Rhyacophila caddis. Certainly the rivers I fish have lots and lots of these and fish love them. It's meat and two veg for a trout and a grayling is this. I'm going to tie it again on a curved grub hook. I tie them on, on eights, tens and twelves. I don't go smaller, smaller than a twelve. Remember the grub itself when it's extended is about an inch long so it's a fairly big beastie. The first thing to do then is to get my lead on. So again I'm using this sticky back lead sheet. Take off my strip of about a millimetre and a half wide. Cut it full length just to, so that you keep your, your piece of lead neat. You don't need all this lead though. You can't just wind on lead willy nilly. And if you put too much lead on the whole thing will look far too bulky. So there's me lead now going on, so I touch it down well round the bend. After three wraps, I can let go of the tag, the lead grips, and I wind forward in touching turns. And this time I won't go back, I'll nip it off there, nip off the tag, and then I'll join the piece back on again, coming up about three turns from the end. wrap on again and I'll nip it off before I get to the end. In other words, I've put my lead on in such a manner that I've got a very slim curved banana shape tapered at both ends. Now on with my thread, but leave yourself a good tag of thread so that you can use this for tying off the yarn at the front. I'll tie that in, leaving the tag hanging out at the back initially but I'll take that to the front later on. So there's my thread on. And then you want some light green, light green ribbon material. This is, this is made by Krynik. It's the, one of the Krynik range. You can buy it in any haberdashers or dressmaking shop. Or you can use the low flash pale green luminescent uh, ribbon material. Tie that in, come right down to the end of the shank, and then you want your body material. Now this is my soft four ply sparkle yarn, but unfortunately this is almost now all used up. If you haven't stocked up on this, the thing to do is to look for a pale green yarn in a knitting shop, and it wants to be a man-made fibre. So as long as it's synthetic, it's ideal. The colour to aim for is this light Granny Smith colour. This is four ply, this sparkly yarn. You've got to work out whether you want to use all four plies or just three. So what I do, I twist it up tight and just wrap this on at the thickest part. And this gives me some idea as to whether I need one of the plies out. And I can tell straight away that that has to have one ply out. So I just separate the plies and slide one out. Now what I've got to do is taper one end. So I expose about, let's say, three quarter of an inch of sparkle yarn, and with your thumbnail, just start ripping out fibres. Move your finger forward, rip a few more out. Move your finger and thumb forward, rip a few more out. And you can see the ripped out fibres. So I'm producing, I'm producing a taper now. And I'll show you this in a second. Right, now if I twist this up, there you can see the yarn's tapering. I tie this in now using what I call a chasing the tail technique. I lay the yarn over on the unshaven part and I start pulling it through because I want to bundle all those fibres together. So as it's just about to pull out, I drop another wrap over further on towards my tie down point. Pull again, drop another wrap over. 
pull again and then I've got it so I've got all the fine tapered ends I've got them all caught in now for safety drop on two whips or a half inch now with this tag of tying thread that I had I wind that forward because I wanted to put this end now the eye of the hook end and do a couple of whips there just to keep it in place and now I'm ready to make the nice deep segmented abdomen twist the yarn up don't twist it too tight to start with it's only held in by some fine fibers there so just ease off on the tension there and then start to wrap this on once I've got a couple of turns on then I can twist twist and twist it tighter as you lay these on make sure that you leave a gap between each segment wind away every time keep twisting and once you get onto the thick part that hasn't been tapered you can really twist it as tight as a steel cord almost just come along with your nails and make those gaps distinct remember the actual lava has got deep a deep uh, grooved segmented body it's got rounded segments with very deep sutures when you get to there I'm now within about four turns of the eye of the hook I've got to taper this yarn down to get it a nice front taper on the lava itself it's impossible for me to cut this yarn to length off the vise and taper both ends because I don't know where this end's going to come so I've got to do this in situ so what I do now I trap that with my finger there to stop it unwrapping and then let the front part, the part I've been holding, let that unwrap and with my fingernail against my thumbnail I start ripping out fibres producing that front taper so I'm, I'm ripping out fibres working back towards me put tension on again twist this up and there you can see the taper at the front and there's all the fibres are stripped back so just you may need to just back a turn off so that you can tighten it all in twist and twist and twist until you get it really tight and now continue wrapping and you get a nice neat front taper which looks very good there's your front tag of thread that you made an excess of and just simply drop that over and lock off that excess tag of thread now comes into use wrap around a few times make sure it's very very tight the last thing you want is this coming undone and drop on a whip finish so that's a fairly simple nice deep segmented abdomen that you've produced and it's once you get the hang of it it's no it's no big deal you can do this quite simple just get the waist out of the way and now I'm ready to put the legs now this is the part where in my book in masterclass a lot of people got upset because they couldn't do the legs the way I'd shown in my book what I've done now I've come up with a much simpler idea of doing the legs so apologies to you people that have been struggling with these legs this is this now is much easier what I do, I invert the hook in the vise, or turn the vise over. This is why you've left the bobbin at this end, because now you're going to use it for putting the legs in. So, you just simply follow those grooves. This is Moser Power Silk again. You can use yellow or white. Let the bobbin hang where you want your first, or should I say, your last set of legs. For the legs, I'm using this dyed partridge hackle. Take out one of these feathers that they're a sort of a light grey on the on an undyed skin they've no chestnut bars on these completely speckled feathers take one out strip off all these lower inferior fibers 
I don't want those. Let the feather rest against the ball of your finger and with your scissor point, just slightly opened, only just slightly opened, pierce through, hit the quill, feel the prick into your finger and snip. And there you've taken out a little central V and then strip back fibres, strip back the barbs, leaving a clump of, let's say, seven or eight fibres up either side. Get your first feather, either concave side up or concave side down, it doesn't really matter, to suit yourself. Lift the, th the tying thread up, slip the feather under with a soft wrap, drop down into that valley. That pulls the feather deep into the groove of the segment. Now drag these through, setting the length. The legs on a rayak are only little short stumps, so you only want legs about eighth of an inch maximum. Once you're happy with the length, put more tension on your bobbin, keep tension on and spiral forward to the next groove. Let the bobbin hold, take your scissors and snip off that waist side. Then come back to your feather, take out that centre bit that, you, that you've just wasted, pull forward some more fibres, this is your centre pair of legs, Offer it up again as you did before, with a soft wrap, then pull down into the groove. Now slide through, and again try to get the middle pair, the same size as the back pair, and wind forward to the next groove. Take your scissors, support your hand, and tweak out the tip. Now for the front pair of legs, you will need another feather. You're not, you're not going to get it out of that uh, original feather, so You've got to come back to your skin and take out another feather. Do the same as before. Take out the centre. Just find the quill. You only want to hit the quill. Separate back the fibres. So you've got this nice clump here for your front legs. As before, lift up the thread Sit the feather across, trap it in the groove, pull through, pull, 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 keep pulling until you've got the legs right. Put weight on and now simply spiral forward now to the eye. And just in the interest of safety and security, drop on two whips. And then you can come back to your feather, slip your scissors behind and snip off that waist side. So there's your nice three clumps of legs on the underside of the lava. All you've got to do now, your thread's waiting there at the eye of the hook, pick up your ribbing material, wind that forward, make sure it pulls down deep inside the very deep segments of the lava. This cleans up your segments, makes them more defined Wind it along. That one's going in at the back of the back legs. That one's going in at the back of the middle legs. And that one's going in at the back of the front legs. Through to the eye. Drop the thread over. Shorten your working thread. Tie off. And I've only now a little bit of crimping to do to finish the fly off. Cut off the waist rib and come straight over with a two finger whip finish which you also build up a nice little conical head. Pull tight and sever your thread. All I've got to do now is to pick out some gills. The gills on the natural are very, very obvious to the naked eye. I have to say though, you don't necessarily need to do this. This is just me that's doing it. So if you don't want to pick the gills out, don't bother. I just find it makes a nice looking lava. So I just go in with a bodkin on each of the rounded segments and just prick in just a few fibers. Just drag them out and feel them snap. You can actually hear them twing. 
You can also use the uh, um, rifle bottle cleaner from a 177 air rifle which I've got which I'll show you in a second. You're only going into picking out three or four fibres on each side so don't be too savage. And then there's the ra rifle bottle cleaner, it's just a, like a, a fine wire flow brush. You can just scrub that up the side, just give it a, a brush them out. Do that on that side. So when you've raised these up, you should see a row of sparkly little fibres sticking out. And then I take my scissors then and just trim them all to length to about, oh, about a sixteenth or even less, about a thirty second of an inch. Do the same on that side. Or support your thumb so that you make a very accurate cut. Finally, with a olive marker pen, I just wipe up the dorsal surface. This deposits ink on the tops of the rounded segments, but not in the valleys. It looks very dark at first, but this ink will dry out and become olive. And then if you want to tint the head with a yellow marker pen, you can tint the head. The heads of the natural is a yellowy orange. But it's only a small head and it's only a small detail. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. One last thing now to remember when you finish your RIAC, you put these legs on with by spiralling the tying thread forward. And they've only been held down by one thread wrap. So it's essential now that you take some runny head cement and just allow a droplet of head cement just to wipe into there right where you've tied them down. Do that to all three sets. That will soak in and it will be effectively belt and braces. So these legs, I can assure you if you do this with head cement, they won't pull out. So there's your IAC. Hydrocycle lava are arguably the commonest caddis lava found in, in any running river water situation. They require clean, fast flowing water. They're very common throughout the Northern Hemisphere, probably the commonest. Whenever I do kick sampling or stone turning, I find probably five hydrocycle caddis to one rhyacophila caddis. Very readily eaten by trout and grayling. It's got a row of gills underneath its abdomen six little dark legs, a nice, plump, juicy, well-segmented body. It's not got deep segmentations like the Rikophila caddis larva. This has got shallow segmentations, but still quite distinct. One feature that distinguishes it is at the tail end of the natural, there's two little forked anal appendages with little brush-like filaments at the end. So they're very easy to identify. I've got a semi-realistic hydrocyclic caddis larva. That's got the little tail appendages, like the real one. It's got the body gills, and the underside of a hydrocyclic larva is well endowed with body gills. And then I've got the six legs, the veliorti legs. So there's my hook in the vise. I'm using a K4A. And the first thing to do, because this is going to be a deep sinking lava, is to get the lead on. After two or three wraps, it's well adhered. Now you can just do hand over hand, butting turns. Come down until you're about one lead width from the eye. Stretch it slightly, pull tight and go back, again making butting turns. Come along, come along. And when you're about three turns short of the end, just nip it off. And now get your tying thread on. And I'm using olive power silk. 
Now I'm going to just slightly re-angle that in the jaws, just turn it down in a little bit because I'm working right around this bend here. Just trim off that waist. Bring the thread way around the corner, well round the bend. And now tie in your little tail appendage. For this I'm using a file of plume from a partridge feather. If you take any partridge body feather out, you will find adhering to it a little file of plume. It's like a little downy feather, almost like a marabou plume. Just tweak that off the parent feather. Strip off some of the lower fibres so that you've got a little tiny tag. Sit this file of plume on with the concave side downwards. Tight on in the on the flat. It's got to stay flat. And two or three more turns catches it down. And then with your scissors, just take out the centre. What you've done is you've made a little grey V. It's just like a little grey V like that. What you do now is you shorten that grey V by holding the two tags together. Just draw the two sides in and snip across. Now I want my nymph skin and it comes in two widths, wide and narrow. You can see it's in a long length. All you need to take off is about three inches, no more. Because it's going to be stretched, a piece that length is ample. Cut a little angular, make a little angular cut at the end. That's the long side and that's the short side. The long side is going to be the trailing edge. So I position this, I bring my tying thread just a little bit further forward and trap down. Once you've got it tied in, as long as you keep tension on the bobbin, you can stretch it so that the tying in point is finer. and tie down very tightly. Now for body gills, I'm using this material. This is natural, natural grey ostrich hurl. So choose three nice intact plumes, one of which will be for insurance in case you get a breakage. Take out your three plumes, hold them all together, backstroke now the fibres to make them stand upright. Tie these in so that they rotate to the underside. So with an upward pull, keeping the bundle all together, tie them in on the underside. Back to the piece of latex. And then you can just roughly tie in the remaining tags. Just come up the body, tie those in. And then you can just keep tension on, just tweak off the waist. That's just a bit of padding, is that? Just to smooth it out. Then return your thread. You need your thread now down at that end because that's going to be used later for tethering your body gills to your abdomen. So drop two whips around there or a half inch. And now I'm ready to form the abdomen. So just Drop this out of the way. And now take your nymph skin. Remember, the long side is the trailing edge. And now start winding forward. And I make the first abdominal segment. Now what I've got to do with every turn is overlap the previous one. So I come along and don't over segment it. They, look, they don't look right if they're over segmented. Now at that stage I'll just ease tension off the hook and just rotate it back vertical 
or should I say more to the horizontal. Whatever you do, don't let go of this tag end, otherwise it all, all flies off. It just un undoes. You've no chance, you can't stop it, you've got to pick it up and start again. Now just look at those lovely juicy looking translucent segments. Does that look a grub or does that look a grub? And come along and as you get down there, now you're approaching the head end, you can stretch the latex more. Putting quite a lot of tension now to taper it off to the head. When I get down to the front, I have now to present a thread there to tie it in. So I pick my bobbin up, it could be any thread really, but I've just got a spiderweb handy. Just trap the spiderweb between the index finger and the middle finger. Keep tension on the nim skin. Just peel off thread and make a catch. Wrap round, 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 round. Several times until the thread catches. Pass it over your latex and tie down. And even with one turn of spiderweb, although it's only four ounce breaking strain, with one turn, incredibly, it will hold. Break the waist tag off. Just whack on more turns of thread and there I've got that latex in a vice-like grip now. So all I need to do now to finish this off is to get hold of my tag, stick the blade under and snip. Two or three more thread wraps and then come straight round now with a two finger whip finish. Several wraps. Trap there, trap there, slip it out of my fingers, pull through, job done. So that's the lava's body completed. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put these body gills on the underside. And that's why this thread has been waiting here to do that job. What I'm going to do, I'm going to follow the edge of the segments accurately with my tying thread. So I'll just show you what I'm doing before I bind it down. I'm following that back edge all the way up with my tying thread. This enhances the segmentation effect and I'll go up to about there and that, at that position I'll put legs in. So I wind back, so that's the position where the ribs are going, where the thread's going. But as I do this, I'll now be trapping these gills to the underside. So I'll just raise some of the fibres here that I've got pressed down with my finger and thumb. So now I start. There's my first turn, and that's my first lot of gills tied in. So now, as I work along, I just trap these to the underside. And of course, a rotary helps. This Waldron vice is a great boon because it's, it's like a third wrist, and I can just rotate this make sure with every turn that my gills are tied down in the right place. Rotate it back. Follow that back edge accurately. Pull on the thread. This raises the, the gills. Rotate it again. Pull on the thread. I'm following that, that edge accurately. Make sure your gills are central. And you just proceed in this fashion all the way along.
and you can actually feel you can actually feel the thread sort of click over the edge and drop into the groove and this is looking quite quite good and I've one more turn to make so that's far enough with the body gills so now all you do is you take your scissors and just sever those off and just trim that up a bit neater there and now I'll just push these fibres vertical they just tend to migrate down a little bit to the sides and they're all now on the underside and it look it should look like should look like a continuous frill all the way on the underside of the nymph of the larva. For the legs I'm stripping off fibres from a golden pheasant tail not by pulling down in that direction but by stripping across like that and the result is a row of hooked little legs curved little legs. You take a couple off. Now what you've also got to do is you've got to decide which way you want your legs to slope. Do you want them curving forwards like that which I think look good or do you want them curving backwards like that which also looks good. So it's your choice. What you want to try to avoid is some forward and some back. So pick my first leg up at the back of my thread, feed it over to the far side against the tension of the thread and place it there. Pick the next one up and place it at this side. And they've gone on nice. Just want to now ease the far one further over to the other side, so I'll do that with the point of my scissors. You can sometimes just drag it over like that. Then when you've got them sighted correctly all you do now is just get hold of the tip of the fiber and just drag through to set the leg length do the same on this one and then once you're happy with the position you just pull on the thread and up come the legs because what you're doing is you're crushing it into that yielding material this latex and then you spiral forward into the next groove, keeping tension on your bobbin. And then you take your scissors and you just come in at the back side and trim off the waist and trim off the waist there. So there's your first pair of legs. Pick up another one, pass it over to the far side, make sure it's in line with its partner. Pick up another one, put it on this side Just a tiny bit of weight on the bobbin, slide through, slide through, pull on the thread, just push that one back a little bit, pull on the thread, up they come, spiral forward into the next groove, take your blade, Make sure you go between the legs, don't snip a leg off in the process. Don't they look good? Now, the last pair of legs. Sometimes a certain feather yields perfect legs and sometimes another feather yields horrible legs. So it's a question of getting a, a, buying a full tail and doing several trial strips to find which one gives the best hurls, the best fibres and as you can see this time they're all going on and facing the right direction with very little aggro and that one just a whisker pull on the thread up come the legs and now wind through those last that last spiral all the way up to the eye maintaining tension throughout 
and while you've still got tension on drop on a, a whip finish and then you should have when I snip these waist sides off you should have six legs more like a hydrocyche than an actual hydrocyche and that's it that's the tying done so now just rotate it back come straight on with a two finger whip finish and make a nice neat but obvious head so apart from the the legs the tying itself is no big deal take my blade and off we come there's one last thing to do which is very important we've got to colour it so with a a brownie olive marker pen I just wipe along the entire dorsal surface try not to get it on the gills and just make the dorsal surface a nice brownish olive and that bit up at the thorax I always blacken I blacken the th thoracic area up to where the legs are including the head of course just a touch of head cement give it a little glossy bounce so there you are that's a fairly realistic or a super impressionistic hydrocycle lava Okay, this time we're going to tie the ever popular case caddis. This is the caddis that tows its portable home with it. You've all seen them. They inhabit just about every type of water that is on the planet, from alpine torrents to stagnant roadside ditches. They're everywhere. It's a very, very popular and, and readily eaten fish food. Trout and grayling love them. That's the wee fella. The caddis that's known by millions of people right down to school children know about these I'm using the size 8 H1A long shank hook first thing to do obviously this is going to fish deep so I'm going to put plenty of weight on so I take off my usual one and a half millimeter strip of lead foil try to cut it quite parallel you're going to need almost all of this lead because these these particular flies are really hard on the bottom. They only get carried along in the stream in floods um, and that's when fish eat them, but fish know about them all the time. They also go hunting for them and suck them up off the bottom, but yours is going to be fished in a dead drift form. So start the lead right on the point of the bend where it starts going round the corner. Attach the lead, and now wind forward, again, as usual, in butting turns. Come forward, but remember to leave sufficient at the front for a grub space, because this is going to be a case caddis with a grub peeping out of the case. So now you wind your sticky back lead back. You can nip off that starting tag now. Wind your sticky back lead back, back to the starting point, all the way back in butting turns. When you get there, you come forward again. As you can see, I'm whacking on a load of lead here. Come along, up to that point where we turned round. So there's the lead in, and you can always take it out and test it in your hands and check whether you have enough lead on. That feels about right for me. So, on now with your tying thread. And because I'm gonna make this with a white grub, it's important that you use a whitish thread. If you use a, a different colored thread to the grub, and for the grub I'm gonna use this white baby wool, whatever you do, 
don't choose to tie it with a colour that's a strong contrast. I mean, black would look hideous. So you need to have a colour that's similar to the white uh, yarn I'm using for the grub. On with your thread, come onto the lead, and just cocoon up and down this lead a few times. It just helps to give a bit of friction, a bit of gripping when you, when you wrap the material on. You could also smear this with head cement if you wanted. It helps to sort of stick it all down. I know you shouldn't use the word stick in fly time, but it does. Then bring your tying thread off the lead onto this grub part. Take your yarn, cut off about eight or nine inches, tie this in up near the front. Bring your tying thread down, tie it down all the way to where the case is going to start. So now wind this white baby wool on, come up to the eye, just twist it up slightly. And now come back so you're making a double layer of baby wool and that's your white peeping grub. Tie that off very securely. Take your scissors and snip off the waste. Now for the case, <clears throat> I'm using this pre-spun deer hair, it's natural dark grey deer hair in a dubbing loop and they're made by Jan Schimann in the Czech Republic. They're available everywhere now. So I'm going to use the natural dark grey colour. Just strip one out and as you can see it just looks like a monstrous chenille of deer hair, but it's very, very handy. Lots of uses in fly tying. So, run the tying thread down to the end of the shank, and just off the bend, tie this in. And tie it in mega securely, make sure nothing's going to move. And then, for added security, just tie the tag down. Snip off, bring the tying thread forward now to the point where you want your case to finish and now simply pick this shaggy chenille of deer hair up and without any fuss and bother just wrap it on like a monstrous great rough hackle. When you get up there, I just like to stroke these fibres back so that they don't run over the front of the grub part. So when you get to the grub part, tighten it down securely and stroke the fibres back. Bring your fingers forward, stroke the fibres back and then come round with your thread and simply lock off. Lock off, lock off, support the eye with your thumb and there you've got it. Now take your scissors, simply trim off the waist tag. Well, that's, that's it except for putting the legs in now. All you do now <clears throat> is lift these fibres up, just stroke them forward and with your scissor blade making long, flat, horizontal cuts with a slight taper just come round and give the whole thing a haircut. So what I'm making is a nice dark, nice dark sort of sandy pebbly finish by trimming this close. Try to keep the cuts parallel, or should I say straight sided, but with a slight taper. Most, most case caddis homes, the, the actual case itself, as a slight taper from the anterior end to the posterior end. These tag ends, you can sever these off, just sort of rounding off the end of the case. And then I just go around the front and with my scissors held at a different angle, I trim and make sure that there's a clean division between end of case and start of grub. So I've got a, like a nice sharp delineation. 
Okay, so there's the case caddy so far. Now I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to put the legs on now. Turn it over. Run your tying thread forward now about a millimetre and pull the thread into the grub to make a groove. And now to make the legs, you want, I think it's better to buy, to get a brand new golden pheasant hull tail. Take out one of the centre quills and what you're looking for, a nice, nice big chunky barbules. For some reason, I don't know why, but it's the golden pheasant that makes the best legs. And what you do is you strip these off. But if you strip them off coming down that way, pulling in line with the centre stalk or centre shaft, instead of getting a nice little hooked end, which is like a little curved leg, you get a curly pig's tail, which is what you don't want. So what you do is you strip them off going across the axis of the feather. So you strip them off going that way. And the result is you get these nice little curved ends that make lovely little legs. So if you're very clever, you can put these on two at a time. But as a beginner, you'll probably manage better doing one at once. I'm going to put legs on this now and tie this in so that when the leg cocks up, the curved barb, that leg part will be forward, not back like that. If it does go back, try to get all the lot going back. So it's either all forward or all back. So I like them to curve forward. So you lift it up against the weight of the bobbin, swing it over and put it in position. Pick the other one up for this side put it behind the thread, put that against the, the other one with a slight gap between them. Having got them, having got them in position, roughly, I can now just push them down to the, about the 45 degree position. And now I get hold of the tag end, I put slight pressure on the bobbin, I get hold of the tip end of the feather of the barb, and I draw through for length. So what I'm doing now, I'm setting the caddis leg length. Pull through. Once you're happy with the length of the leg, support the hook, pull on your thread, and up come the legs, just like magic, look. Take another turn round. So each set of barbs you've just tied in are secured by two thread wraps, not just one. Then you can just ease them back further now advance your thread, keeping tension on, advance your thread forward about a millimetre and a half. Take your scissors and snip off the waist side of the barbs you've just put in. That's to say the legs. Pick up another set of feather barbs with the little curved tangs on the end. Pick them up against the weight of the bobbin. Sit them over there. That's one in, pick the other one up, sit it there, slide through, slide that one through, make sure that they're sitting one behind the other. Once you're happy with the length, again support the hook. Pull on your thread, take another wrap through, snip off the waist side, snip off the waist side of that one, and you're ready with the last pair of legs. Wind your thread forwards again, about one more millimetre. Again, lift this up against the weight of the bobbin. Position it in line with the previous ones. Get the other one. Slide through. Slide through. And if, you, if you're really clever, as you come from the back pair of legs 
to the middle pair of legs to the front pair of legs so you can make each one go shorter. Then when you're happy, tension on again, up pop the legs, round with your second securing thread wrap and now you're done. Take your scissors, again carefully search in, just move the leg out of the way, you don't want to crop a leg off at this stage, we don't want crippled caddis flies. So all you do now is wind forward to the eye, few more thread wraps on there, and then to make the dark head I'll get a dark brown marker pen, darken my thread, darken about four or five inches of thread, and simply wind on to make a nice dark brown distinct head. Run off some thread and come through with your two finger whip finish. Slide through and snip off. And that's the that's the case caddis with the nice little Valiotti legs. And if you want to put some dark marks on the grub on top, there's nothing to stop you just dotting this. This is cheating really, but you can just, just put a little thoracic saddle patch there with your same brown marker pen. Get some runny head cement, and what I do, I coat the entire case and give it a good a good coating with quite runny head cement and go all round and really sort of work it into the deer hair. Just push it in with a needle point. It'll soak in anyway. But you need to keep hands off it now. And also remember just that little area there where you tied the legs in. Just run some in there. That's a bit of a belt and braces job. And also just a dab on the actual head, make a glossy head. That'll soak in. And that's it. Simple. The third essential skill is matching the tactics to the river characteristics. Think about where trout and grayling are likely to be found, and then what fly fishing techniques should be used. I'm on a bridge overlooking the River Yore in North Yorkshire. This is Yorkshire's premier trout stream. It's probably more noted really for its grayling. Uh, there's grayling in this stream up to about a pound and a half, maybe the odd occasional two pounder. This stream is ideally suited to all, all types of nymph fishing, but it's particularly suitable in places for check nymphing. Now when I look over this bridge here, I can see it's got very convoluted currents. It's quite interesting, there's a very strong current seam under this parapet here, but in the centre of the bridge there's one dead area just below the centre buttress, in fact, it's almost like a still pond. Now, those are the areas that you've got to avoid. But on either side, there's two lovely tongues of water going down. And they run out for about 15, 20 yards. And those are the areas that I would look for when I were check nymphing. Look for areas with strong current. Because remember, with check nymphing, you're fishing three heavy nymphs, and they've got to carry. They must move along without hanging up in the, on the stream bed. All in all, it's uh, a very interesting looking uh, bridge pool is this. Some very nice current scenes. And I'll give it a whirl. The ideal rod for the short line nymphing, or check nymphing, should be anywhere between 9 foot 6 and 10 feet in length. 
It should be a through action rod, quite responsive, but not stiff or tippy. And virtually no line is cast, so the line rating is fairly meaningless. However, this particular rod I'm using is rated for a number six line. Leader makeup for checking anything couldn't be simpler. Basically what you've got is a leader with three flies on. There's your point fly, 20 inches your middle dropper, another 20 inches your top dropper. So between the point fly and the top dropper you're going to have about a metre. There it is. With your heaviest fly in the centre. On the top dropper I've got a high vis check nymph, middle dropper about a size 6 hydrocycle lava and at the point a size 12 rikophila lava. Remember when you're making your leader up that when you've made your two or three turn water knot the part that you trim off is the up upstream tag and the part that you leave on is the downstream tag. In other words, this leg, the dropper leg, is part of the parent mono. So that if you get a fish on your droppers, the pull of the fish is going through the main line upstream of the fly and not trying to split the knot apart. And then you make sure that the overall length from point fly to minicon is about a rod length. Up at the top, on the end of the fly line, I've got a permanently attached red minicon. If you can't get the red ones, white ones are okay. Just tint them red with an edding pen, leave them to dry overnight. And that's my sighter. Tied on there with a four turn half blood knot. Leave the tag proud, it doesn't matter. And that's, the sim that's an absolutely simple makeup. Parallel, remember this point, it's parallel mono all the way through of about three and a half pound breaking strain. Any lighter than that, and if you get fast on the bottom, which you're going to do, the chances are you'll lose your flies. You'll certainly lose one. You may lose all the lot. Okay, so that's the makeup. This run looks very, very interesting in front of me, so let's go out and give it a whirl. One thing you've got to remember when you're fishing anywhere is that don't just walk straight into the best looking spots. Always fish your way out. So I'm just gonna fish this quickly through as I work out into the main areas. The run where I want to fish is ahead of me, but rather than just walk straight up to it, there's always a chance of picking a fish up on your way up to the better parts. As they say, the fly that's in the water is the fly that catches the fish. And that looks, that looks to be some deeper water over there with a nice speed to it, so hopefully we'll connect over here. Water's getting slightly deeper now where my flies are. Remember when you're checking in, you can only have about a yard of fly line out. Some people find it quite an unusual and almost disarming method of fishing. They can't quite get the hang of fishing so short. They don't actually believe that you can catch fish at such short range. Also, You've always got to check when you're fishing this method that you're not picking up weed as I've just done. Because if you pick weed up, as sure as hell, you're not going to catch a fish because trout and grayling don't like salads. So the, the poles and the checks have perfected this technique and now it's widely used throughout the entire UK. It's not yet filtered across to America. They do another form of nymphing called high sticking where they have far more line out than this and they actually physically cast rather than this method which is just a, an overhand swing. The flies have got to windmill round in a complete circle. Watched out for the trees overhead with this style of casting. You can be up in a tree dead easily. All the line off the water right up to the minicon mandatory strike at the end of each drift. That looked like a take but it could be weed. Yes a little bit of weed on the tail fly. Now the idea with this method of fishing is to make sure that the flies don't come underneath your 
retreating fly light. They just keep the Minicon travelling slightly faster than the current. In other words, they've all got to be coming down behind the Minicon. That's to say the Minicon is leading. If they took under and you get a take, it won't register. You watch the Minicon, you glue your eyes on the Minicon and strike at the least sign of a take. If it stops, if it stabs, if it deviates, if it does anything. This is firing from the hip fishing. There we go, there's a fish. Nice grayling. When you're handling fish, don't handle fish with hot, dry hands. So at this stage, I've got my hand in the water, getting it nice and chilled. It's a decent fish. There he is. Come on, baby. Nice grayling. Whoops. Slip the hook out. And away he goes. That was a nice quick success. Okay, so I straighten again. Some nice broken water ahead. I mean, ideally, what you should do when you're fishing up a run is be mindful of the speed of the current and depth and change flies to suit the current. So if you come to fast water that's a little bit deeper, you can change back again to heavier flies. It's a question of, if you like, weighting the flies to suit the condition. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to just change this centre fly, put a slightly lighter fly on. Take this heavy hydropsyche off and put a small one, I've put a 12 on, which is just a little bit lighter leaded. Now it's looking very fishy ahead of me, nice, a nice depth. I'm going to fish through it fairly quick, no point in labouring. Take three or four fan casts. If they want it, they have it more or less straight away. Yes, there we go. Another nice grayling. Okay, baby, go down. Nice fish, about a pound. If you keep your rod low and keep weight on them, they'll eventually yield. Just shorten a bit of line off. That's quite a strong, strong scrapper, is this lad? Okay, yeah, a bit bigger than the other one. It's taking the hydropsyche at middle dropper, the one I just changed to. Come on. <laughs> if the thrash like that, just sit them back in the water. They go quiescent then and slip the hook out. So that's uh, that was again fairly quick success by fishing fast. Over we go again. So there you have it. I look at what trout and grayling find to eat on the river bed. Some matching artificials and the right tactics. One last point, respect the fish, play them quickly, handle them with cold wetted hands and always, always use barbless hooks or crush down the barbs.
In this video we cover two more techniques for tackling fast streamy water. Upstream nymphing in shallow riffles and wet fly fishing using North Country spiders. Both these techniques are classically British and are essential skills. Although upstream nymphing was born on southern chalk streams, it's also very effective on fast flowing rocky freestone streams. Remember though, you're going to be very very busy in the fast water, but it's a rewarding technique both in terms of numbers and size of fish. Wet fly fishing with spiders is as old as the hills and firmly rooted in the north. It's a delightful, more relaxed way of fishing, but don't be deceived by its simplicity. It's still a very, very effective technique and another essential skill for every fly fisher. But first, let's go bug hunting. As river fly fishermen, it's very important that we understand what's down there in the river underneath our feet, ready to hatch. This will key us in on the main species for us to tie when we're back at the tying bench. Down there, underneath our feet, as we wade, there are myriads and myriads of life forms. To find these samples, it's dead easy. All you need is a piece of kit like this. This is in fact nothing more than a piece of my wife's neck curtaining. Two foot six to three feet long. I got her to run a seam up both sides, just big enough to pass a brush handle through. I got an old brush handle, sawed it in two, shoved it down each side, and that's it. And it's called a kick net. Some people call it a kick seine net. It's actually a very simplified version of what the biologists use for doing stream sampling, for getting index samples. And all you do is this. You go out into the stream, find somewhere where there's some current, go in, preferably where, preferably where the bottom is pebbly that you can kick up, stand upstream of the net, in other words the current's coming from behind you, plunge the net in vertical right down to the riverbed and then kick the bottom up for all you're worth. That way you dislodge all the little invertebrates and they get washed by the current into the net and then you bring the net out and look with two fish well I found quite a lot and what you need actually is a wide diversification of life not just one food form I can start separating all this moss and junk I'll just take my specs off there we are we've got a Betis nymph these are members of the mayfly group the class is agile darters and when you see them swim you can understand why they're called agile darters they've got a tiny little motor in them that spurts them for about three or four inches and then they rest look at the three tails if it's got three tails it's a mayfly if it's got two tails it's a stonefly you can see the, that the predominant color of the betis nymphs is, is a shade of olive that one's got nice nice dark wing buds as you can see that tells you it's very near to hatching time. If it's got light wing buds, it's some way to go yet. That's unquestionably the nymph of the yellow maze, that Heptogenia sulfurea, clusters, flat stone clingers. Look at its lovely striped femurs. They're very, very delicately marked with the little bars across them. On the underside of these, look how pale yellow they are. That again tells me that within there, is the, the adult is maturing quite nicely. Also again on these, look how long that tail is there. It's longer than the insect itself. Case caddis, square section caddis case. Might have been occupant in it or it might have hatched and flown. It could be a granum case. Hydrocyclava. We're finding quite a good diversity. The only thing I haven't found so far, which I'm a bit surprised about, is a yellow Sally stonefly nymph. Here's another big stone clinger. Look, look at this, another belter. This shows a river in very good heart. We've seen some of the important invertebrates that live in this river that the fish feed upon. We've studied their form and their shape and their coloration. So let's get back to the tying room now and tie them.
We're now going to look at the mayfly family of nymphs, in particular the Betis group. Betis nymphs are very, very important to the fly fishermen. It's the major hatch in spring, and it's one which, as fly fishermen, we must home in on. They're so important that I have my fly box here, and I have one leaf completely given over to the mayfly family. Here I've got two rows of Betis nymphs, uh, then I've got flat stone clingers, yellow may emerges, more flat stone clingers, and some more much smaller Betis nymphs down at the bottom. So Betis nymphs, I cannot overemphasize, are very, very important. So now we're going to be tying flies in size of 16 and 18. There's a 16 Betis nymph in my fingers. This actual fly, this very fly, just a few weeks ago, caught my biggest ever wharf brown trout of 19 inches. We're looking at a fly with an overall body length, excluding tails, of no more than about seven millimetres. So, let's make a start. So I've got here a standard size 16 long shank nymph hook. As usual, it's going to be leaded, but this time, because these nymphs are super slim, we have to lead it very carefully to make sure we don't add too much bulk in the wrong place. Peel off the back in. And now, when you enter the lead now, start with your first wrap of lead, just forward of opposite the point. Certainly no further down the shank than that. Lock your lead on, wind forward. Then when you get just short of the eye, come back over. This is now going to be the thorax area to about there. And then if you want a little bit more weight, you can just allow yourself to go back with another couple or maybe a third wrap. And then nip that off. I'll just tweak off that spell it. So no lead at all down to the end of the shank. I'm tying now with spiderweb throughout this entire fly. Build a little bit of a taper at the back of the lead so there's no abrupt edge. And then come down to the end of the shank and there you're ready to put the tails in. For the tails, I'm using this material, which is badger. Choose three fibres that are complete with the fine tips. You may be looking and get three all at once that have intact tips. Tweak them off. Align the tips so that they're all in line. Do that in your fingers. So, there are my three tails, all nicely aligned. I offer them up to the top of the shank. I do a pinch and loop, and I lock those in. Take three or four wraps around under moderate tension, and then get hold of all the three butts, and drag through. Don't worry if one flies out wildly. Pull through, pull through until you've got tails that are about one and a quarter the length of the abdomen. And then hold all the tips together. Now put full tension on your thread and bind down now, heading towards the bend. And go right onto the bend literally the start of the bend and stop then take your scissors just slide them underneath the butts and neatly sever them off now what you've got to do, you've got to fork those tails so the easiest way is to come up underneath with your thumbnail and just rock in there press and tilt and that splays them now pull the near one towards you, the far one away from you, and leave the centre one where it is. We've got to fix them now in that position, otherwise the current will just wash them back. So what I do now, with my tying thread, I come between the far one and the middle one, come round over the top between the middle one and the near one, and again, 
and again and one last turn under the middle one only to raise it up and part the thread so there are your three nice permanently splayed tails now for the abdomen I'm going to use this yellowish olive flexi body I'm taking off a strip only about a sixteenth wide just slightly widening and making it a little bit wider as I go along but not much so in other words it's a slight wedge shape peel off my flexi body just cut in the tying in point just cut a little sharp tying in tag and now offer this up to the top of the fly come in between a couple of tails which will help to hold it in place and catch that down so catch this little tying in tag down sometimes it wants to wander that's got it and tie that down working back stretch it slightly working back to the base of the tails but don't upset the set of the tails and then two more thread wraps try to keep thread wraps away from the tail end of the fly that's the end that's got to have the fine taper on so no more thread wraps at the tail end you've done all you need there you've got your tails tied in you've got your flexi body tied in move your tying thread now forward look now for depressions in the abdomen and just dub these out with tying thread what you're going to do now is you're going to come all the way along starting from behind the leaded thoracic area and with the tying thread with this spider web i'm going to make this one nice continual slim taper geometrically tapering try to avoid lumps and bumps and don't go any further down than there find any low spots and drop thread into them in other words you're making it nice and smooth smooth and tapering that looks not bad and you can just rub your nail along if there's any bits that are high great for wing buds I'm using the fibers from a primary feather of a crow but it can be anything it could be turkey or duck or goose but this is this is ideal and it's readily available so take off two slips just plunge in there with your blade I'm not going to opposite feathers here it's not necessary you don't need a left and a right try to get these both the same just go through with your scissor point and make a snappy cut like that peel that off try to keep them both the same maybe I've made this slightly too wide it's easy in your fingers just to go in with your scissor point and peel off the number of fibers that it's too wide by and then you simply take one of these slips you see there's a shiny side and a dull side when I fold it over I want the dull side to come to the top so I tie it in with the shiny side uppermost at this stage so I offer it across the shank like that at an angle and come round with your tying thread and lock it down take the other one and do the same shiny side up cross it now in the other direction come over the soft wrap and lock down and again now climb up onto the thorax and tie down those waist bits with a couple of wraps take your scissors snip off the waist snip off the waist and now I'm ready to produce this nice realistic segmented abdomen so I've got to get these two wing buds out of the way they're flapping in my way here so what I do I lift these over and just drop my tying thread over a couple of wraps to hold them out of the way while I perform now with my flexi body before I do that I get a marker pen darken 
the top side of the nymph. You've got to be careful with a, a felt pen. They are too loaded with ink and they'll bleed to the underside. This is a quick way of giving you counter shading. You know, all creatures have a dark dorsal surface and a lighter belly, a lighter ventral side. So now I just take the flexi body, stretch it slightly to start with, first turn, snug up to the base of the tails, and now work forward with every turn slightly overlapping the previous one. And this just gives you that nice, succulent, really insecty looking, translucent abdomen. Let's just go back to that one, make it a bit more pronounced. That's better. When you arrive at the wing buds, where the wing buds are curving forward, drop this thread off your wing buds and let them spring back. Gather them up like that and tether those down using the flexi body as a tying medium, trapping them down to the sides of the nymph. One more full turn of flexi body brings it to the top, shorten your working thread and tie that flexi body down. Tie down. Don't cut that tag off, you need that. What you do now is you fold that back over and swing it round until it lies between those two wing buds and tie down and tie down. But don't tie it down as far as the wing buds. The wing buds want to spring out rearwards of this flexi body. And then I just crush that with my thumbnail to make it nice and flat. And now I'm ready to put the legs in. For legs I'm using olive dyed partridge and I look for a really short fibred feather that's sort of there in the, in the sort of shoulder blades of the bird. And look for one before you tweak it off that's got all the tips complete. So there's one that I can use. Tweak that off. Strip off the lower fibres. Just roll it off. And now I've got to get right down to this very end. So what I do, I hold one side of the feather and with the ball of my thumb, I stroke the fibres back. Just stroke the fibres back. Turn the feather and stroke the fibres back there. And I've got to get right down so that I'm literally within three or four fibres of the very end of the hackle. Having done that, I simply take the hackle, concave side uppermost, offer that in right where your thread is hanging and come round and catch that tip down. Hold the fibres back and now lock down those tips. And now the dubbing. So we're going to use a darkish olive sparkly SLF finesse. This is Masterclass shade one. It's nice glinty dubbing. Just knock it on and then spread it by trapping it on the side with the ball of your finger and just spread it along by shredding it out with your thumbnail and just make a short roll leg like that and now tighten it in really go to work on it tighten it in so it's very very fine do avoid heavy applications otherwise the thorax will look far far too bulbous right all the legs back out of the way you don't want to trap them down and now come forward and tie down bit of excess on there, slough it off 
And any really straggly spare fibres, there's some there near the head, you can always detach those with the scissor point. So I'm going to show you how to make what I call a head cement sandwich. Because this is tied in with its very delicate tip, you're going to say, well, there's no strength there. That's not going to hold up in a fishing situation. But I'm going to now, if you like, use glue to hold this down. Just put on the top here a little dab of head cement. And then you bring that hackle over. There's the nice legs all nicely splayed. Slight tension on the thread and lock over. Keep the quill line central. Don't pull too much on the quill, otherwise you'll pop it. Tie down, tie down, tie down. That's your legs tied in. Take your scissors, slide the blade under the eye, and detach. I don't want that. I don't want that one. So if I turn this now to the camera, you'll see how we position the legs. Now to complete my head cement sandwich, I'm going to make sure that these leg fibres will never come back together and zip up. You know how feathers zip up. I'm going to make sure they don't zip up. I'm going to keep them separated. So I get my head cement again and drop a touch of head cement now on top of the hackle. And you can see now that that's going to make a solid matrix of, of head cement and these wing buds when it comes over. Now for the wing buds. Far wing bud, pick it up, bring it over to my side. Bring that over, over the legs and tie down. And again. Near wing bud, lift it over the legs. Make sure you go over the legs and tie down. And again, and again. And the last operation, lift the flexi body up. This now splits the thorax, splits the, goes between the two wing buds, opens them up, puts them in a bank on either side, tie that down. Now just separate these two, let the flexi body hang forward, bring those back by holding them like that. Come round with your spider web and tie that flexi body down right there, hard into the shoulders of the eye. Let those two pieces of feather fibre now stick out at right angles. Bring your tying thread back behind them if you want to reduce a little bit of length of these for passing over when you do your whip finish, you can take a bit off. Get hold of that tag. This is your last manoeuvre. Bring that tag of flexi body back. And what's going to happen here, my tying off point is going to be actually in the neck of the creature. It's going to be there, behind the, the head. What that does, it makes sure that you've got a Beautiful clean eye, there's no tying thread, no materials, no nothing sticking out over the eye of the hook. So when you come to tie on, you've got a lovely clear eye to work with. Bring your spider web and now tie down there really hard in the neck. Come round now and lock straight over with a two finger whip finish. And I do a few wraps there, making sure it stays in the neck. Trap there, trap there, pull my finger out, slide through. Just give it a crush down there with my nail as I pull tight. You see that spider web is extremely strong sometimes. See I'm flexing the hook. Fly's completed. Snip off. Lift up my spare tag of flexi body, one cut, that's off. And then look now what happens when I trim off this 
wingbud material leaving a little millimeter tag sticking out I get a little black dot which I suppose you could say looks like an eye and I'll just trim that one a little bit closer so that's the tying completely done you can of course just if you want to be really sure of your whippings just take some head cement and just hit the thread wraps and that's probably my all-time best pattern for uh, spring fishing it may be a complex tie in as much as there are several materials and one or two maneuvers but once you've learnt the route and you've got the route in your head it's a straightforward tie <laughs> I'm now going to tie a flat stone clinger nymph, that group of mayflies known as heptagenids, the heptagenidae. This family of nymphs, historically through fly tying, has been probably the most neglected of all. However, for people that fish on freestone streams, it can be the most prevalent mayfly in the river, uh, and certainly on the rivers that we've just been fishing. They're under every stone, the riverbed is heaving with them. So it is a very, very important group of insects. Most people in the past have just made do with tying a, a sort of a flattened gold-ribbed hairs here and making it quite shaggy and putting long tails on. But they've missed the profile by a mile. So I'm going to show you now how to tie one of these that captures the silhouette of the fly and uh, the fly itself has given me loads and loads of magic moments nymphing. So it is a very, very deadly pattern. I'm tying this on a size 12 hook. First thing to do is get my tying thread on. Snip off the waist. And now take this dark brown raffine. Take off a piece about two inches long. Open this out, it'll open out to about an inch wide, or an inch and a bit, and then fold it just as though you're rolling a, a roll up cigarette. Just fold it, crease it. In my book, I just put in one thickness, but I found that it's better, it's a more reinforced, robust fly if you double it. Cut off now a piece about 3 16 wide, 4 mil wide, say. So there's your piece of a folded raffine. Moisten one end, lay it over the top, sit it on top of the shank, keep it central and just pinch in the sides. Then come round with the tying thread, soft wrap and pinch down. And then keep flattening it with your finger and thumb like that. So you're tightening that in until this raffine is secured right up to the back of the eye. And then just come forward and tie down the waist. And the important thing to look at now is that this piece of raffine has to be central. Bring your tying thread back to within about a millimetre of the, the eye. Take some 20 pound black amnesia shooting head mono. It doesn't have to be that, but it, just any, any sort of 20 to 25 pounds breaking strain mono. It doesn't even have to be black. And just take off about three quarters to an inch. And then what I do now, I just nip it in my teeth to give you a little flat tiny in spot. Lay this across the shank and tie it down right where you've made that little flattened spot. Once you've got it tied in, swing it back square, just support it with your thumb and drop some thread wraps over 
figure of eight fashion now consolidate it and make it nice and firm and don't be happy and satisfied with it unless it's absolutely at right angles to the shank take your scissors now and snip off these strands to about four or five millimeters long now what you do is you pick up your cigarette lighter hold the raffine out of the way hold the thread out of the way Make sure that the light is steady and you go in and just melt one edge. And then just as it's set in, just press there lightly with a wetted finger just to mushroom the end. If you've gone too far, all is not lost. You just simply shunt that over a tad. Remember though, when you're doing this, do not on any account press this molten nylon with a dry finger. If you do, you're going to have a little tiny blister and it'll be as painful as anything. So you finish up with, if you like, what some people might refer to as a couple of heat balled eyes out on stalks. And the stalks are about, uh, in new money, about a millimetre and a half long. I'm doing that so that I've got a little stump as a foundation around which to figure of eight my tine thread. And this is going to give me my broad disc-like head. Bring my tine thread all the way down to the end of the shank and I tie my tails in. And again for tails I'm using badger hair, dyed badger hair. Take out three nice long fibres, complete with the tips. Even these up so that they are more or less all in line. Once you've got them even, just sit them on top. Don't worry about length at this stage. Sit them on top, pinch and loop. Tie them in with three or four wraps. What you do now is you make sure that the tips are in line. And now just tie down the butts for about three or four wraps. Take my scissors, remember to tie them in long, at least once the length of the nymph, and trim off the waist. Now come with your thumb underneath. I've got to splay these, I've got to give them a wide separation. Come with your thumb underneath, and just rock in there. Now take the near tail and pull it towards you. The far tail, push it away from you. The centre tail, stays in the centre. And now to consolidate those and make them stay there, I bring my tine thread between the far one and the middle one, over the top and between the middle one and the near one. Do that again and again, and then I bring my tine thread underneath the middle one to raise it and part the thread. So there are your nicely splayed tails. Now we have to lead the shank, so from the usual strip of sticky back lead I take the also usual one and a half millimetre strip, cut along, nice long cut, keep it parallel. Peel off the backing strip. Offer the lead up, sticky side down of course, just where the thread's hanging, about three or four mil up from the end. Wind on. When you get to just behind the head foundation strip or filament, make three wraps on the spot. And then you give it a pull and come down, snip off the waist, come down but don't come with the lead as far as where you started, finish about there.
and now overlock this with your thread just to reinforce those uh, lead turns zoom up and down a few cross wraps just cocooning the the lead and the carrot shapes already coming up nicely with one or two turns on you can get your pliers because this is a flat nymph remember to start flattening it at an early stage you don't need to bring veins out in your arm just give it a light flattening And now go over again with your tying thread. And any depressions you see, like at the end of the lead there, there's a step down onto the shank, which I'm going to taper off with tying thread. Just working there at the back of the shank of the back of the lead. So I'm trying to produce this distinct carrot shape and remove any any depressions and that'll do for now right parking the thread near the tails and from a piece of I'm tying this to represent a yellow mane nymph so from some pale yellow flexi body take off a strip again about one and a half mil wide it can taper slightly or it can stay parallel it doesn't really matter cut that off Peel it off the backing strip. Cut in a little tiny tag. And now tie this in. Make sure it's insecure by giving it a little tweak. And then from some yellow dyed ostrich hurl take out one nice long plume stroke the fibers in the opposite direction to raise the nap tighten at the tip end but go, don't go right to the tip come up here where it's there's a bit more strength tie that in catch down and then tie in the waist and tweak off the tip. Now position your thread about a third of the way up, up the abdomen. What I want to do now is make this abdomen with these little feathery gills on the side. And the best way to do it is to use this nice hurl. If I just wrap the hurl round and then go over it with flexi body, I'll crush the hurl down, you won't be able to see it. If I wrap the flexi body on first and then wrap the hurl over, the first toothy trout you catch, it'll nick through that, the chances are, it'll nick through that thin hurl stalk and the hurl will come unwrapped and you've no hurled abdomen. I've come up with this method. A hook on the hackle pliers, let that hang off your little finger and then with the hurl, wrap the hurl around the flexi body. And I try to keep the spirals the same. And I don't pull too tight. I don't want to crush the flexi body sides in. I want it to stay flat. And I just wrap away. I keep going. And I, and I do about an inch to an inch and a quarter of this. Just wrap it on. And I'm just allowing it to slip through my thumb and finger of my left hand and my middle finger and ring finger of my right hand. When I get to there, I've done enough now, so I hold there, hold them both, unhook my hackle pliers and re-clip on there. So now I've got a nice piece of hurled flexi body. Rotate it till it's nice and nice and flat, take any twists out and now just simply wrap this on making nice slight overlapping turns and at each turn I get this little 
roof of hell. And you can stroke them backwards if you like. And that's going on really nice. When I get to the hanging thread, the thread sets your position. When I get to the hanging thread, see I've just just done it nice, just got up there. I must have done this before. I lock down, lock down, lock down. And that's tied in. Take my scissors and detach the waist. And then consolidate that with another two or three wraps. So now I'm ready to put the wing case in. For this I'm using a nice mottled feather from a, a grouse. But you can use any feather, any dark speckled feather. It could be partridge or pheasant. What you want to do is choose one that's spoon shaped with the stem straight. This one here, as you can see, it's got a bend in it, which is not suitable, but this one here is a straight stem, and that's just about perfect. So look for the ones that have got the straight stems. Strip off the lower fibres, and make sure that your stripping off point is equidistant, so where the fibres come to the stalk, it's equal, like that. And now, dunk this and I've put some head cement in a in a film canister which gives me a nice little reservoir to dunk it in dunk the whole feather lift it out and just wipe off the excess and get your lid back on before it evaporates you stroke each side of the feather and you pull the top edge and you close it down and you pull the bottom edge and close it down. Don't just wipe like that straight along. Treat each side. Just draw each side down. And as I draw it down, I'm looking for this land shape. The cement is starting to dry. And that's about that's about the shape I'm after. The cement's dry, it's quick drying cement is this, so turn the feather now, hold the feather side, the feather side is down near the, towards the tail end, the stalk side is up towards the head end. Offer it up, central in the fly, in the abdomen, lock over with the thread, right on top of the stem, exactly where the first feather fibres slope back. Tie that in. Come forward, tie the stalk down, take your scissors, trim that off. And now for your dubbing, and I'm using a mixture of yellowish olive and a creamier olive. You can put a little admix of, of sort of a a pale, very, very pale lime green or a very, very pale yellow. And I'll just mix that in my finger and thumb. If you want a quantity of this, you would do it in a little coffee blender. Get the three colours reasonably mixed. I'm looking for a sort of a subtle yellowish olive colour, which is a common belly colour for a lot of the heptogenids. All you need to do when you applying dubbing is this. If you get a roughly teased out row lag on your finger end and you offer it up on the ball of your finger underneath the thread and bisect the amount with the thread and press, you'll see that the dubbing almost folds round the, the thread to start with. It's look, it's that. It folds like that. So I've just used the thread to press into the ball of my finger. All you need to do now is bring that thumb over, drop the thumb on and roll. And roll again. That's the initial scarfing on. 
So that won't drop off now, but I've more work to do to it now. That's in a, a mass there. What I want to do is shred that along. So I support with me one finger, the ball of my finger, and with my thumbnail, I start moving it along and rolling it in. Shred it out, move it along. And then you can tease it backwards with the rolling motion. You can also spread it by just pulling like that. Finger and thumb, finger and thumb, and just pull back. So roll that on. Try to keep your spindle tapering. Thinner at that end than up here. And now you dub. So simply wind on, starting there where that wing bud is springing out. Wind forward, occasionally look on the underside. Make sure you're leaving no gaps. It's the underside that's important. Wind on till you get at the back of the head foundation shape. And then I want a little bit more dubbing on here now. Because I'm going to, with the rest of this dubbing, I'm going to wrap this figure of eight fashion around these two stumps of nylon which stick out. And I'm going to wrap these on to produce this half disc like head shape of the heptagenids. So I dub on about so much. And now I take some head cement and I break all the laws of dubbing now. I apply head cement in rough drops along, along this dubbing. So touch that down with head cement, make it nice and moist. Wipe the needle and your fingers and then come onto the dubbing and roll that in. Then you want a convenient paper towel or failing that, the wife's tablecloth which I'm sure she'd be pleased about. Now take the dubbing and go around those little protruding mushroom-ended bits of mono. Look at the underside, make sure you do the same manoeuvres on the underside. And then make an elliptical movement like that. You might just have to, as you use up and get this filled up, you might just have to steer it around that last one. And then bring the tying thread back into position behind those head foundation stumps. Now with your pliers, give that another flattening. And that looks okay. Look on the underside to make sure you've got this nice carrot shape. And now bring your tying thread back through the dubbing, which effectively tightens the dubbing in, and park it somewhere up from where that wing bud is. Take now some of this sort of yellowish tan round rubber and cut off a piece about an inch long. I'm going to put these legs in now, Madame X style. Position the thread just nicely forward of that wing bud. Bring the rubber behind the thread, lift over and plonk it at the far side. It's what the Americans call the Madame X style. Pick up another piece Pick that up behind the thread and drop this on this side. And now come round with another two full thread wraps. Bring your tying thread forward now, about halfway along, because what I've got 
the point with me bodkin I've got back legs and these are going to be the middle pair but I want them to slope backwards also like that so what I do I've positioned my thread where I want them I simply put that leg there and trap it if the legs are sticking forward like that which you don't quite want you just drop on a little bit more dubbing and just dub a little smidgen of dubbing which makes a little collar in front just spin on a spindle and keep it quite tight and then manoeuvre the leg out of place bring that back slide your dubbing up and now dub there in front of both legs in order to keep them back and in place so that's how I want both the legs to lie come forward now and tighten that down and in goes the last leg this will again go in as a pair but with your scissors you'll remove one of them put it there pick up another one lift that up put that there and tie down pull on your thread quite tightly and then with your scissors what I've got now is I've got four legs down each side so you've got to decide which one you're going to annex with your scissors and I'm going to take out the backward sloping one so take out that and that so now I've got three legs on either side Just remove a bit of length off them so I'm now ready to finish the fly push the wing case down come over with the tying thread and tie down and again and again so there's a nice heart shaped nice large heart shaped wing bud slide your blade under snip off the waist last operation moisten the head capsule cover the raffine push it back keep it folded as, as a double piece and just fret it with your fingers down the side go over those eye stumps those head foundation stumps keep it nice and tight there's the eye of the hook exposed nicely come round now with a tying thread and make a nice neat elliptical head run off some thread and come straight in there with a two finger whip finish and three or four turns is enough because I'm going to seal over the whole of this with head cement pull tight if your thread breaks don't worry because spiderweb usually breaks leaving a little tag and I can just see the tag there snip that off then just lift the excess raffine up and just come along with your scissors and just carefully sever that off just work along and carefully sever that off and now I just look at the legs and just jockey them about if they seem a bit rakish you can take a bit of length off as soon as you take shorten them they spring into another position and what I have to do now is 
set this fly in a completely different angle because I'm going to use a hot tip cauterizer and I'm actually going to slightly melt each leg in turn with the, with the fly tipped on its head I shall melt each leg in turn so that the, melt, the, the part beyond the point where my cauterizer hits topples over like a felled tree so I'm now going to have to sit this fly in a vertical attitude in the vise. I now come up with the cauterizer. I'm going to take the back leg first. So I position the hot tip and just press. And down it collapses. And now do the second one. And now do the front one. That's those three done. And start with the top one again. That's that one. That's that one. And that's that one. So now you bring the fly back into its original attitude. Put it in the correct posture in the vise and all you have to do now is just come along each leg joint and crop off the lower leg to length about there. You can always, if you can come off, if you cut them off long you can always make them shorter later so don't make them too short to start with. Come round to this side and just snip those off. So it's a question of just trimming the lower leg joint. That's the heptogeny completed now. If you bothered about that little bit of white thread there, just with a fibre pen, a brown fibre pen, bluff it out. I also give a bit over the top of the head capsule and then just seal it all over with a thin film of head cement over the entire head capsule because the raffine is quite prone to being attacked by trout's teeth and I let it also flood over the wing bud. Let that dry and that's it. That's going on the end of my leader. And I'm going to give Mr. Trout his supper. Here we've got a classic pool on the River Yore. We've got a fast neck pouring into the main body of the pool. On either side of the fast neck, we've got shallow stony water, then the main tongue of current going through the centre. Absolutely perfect water for fishing spiders. Also perfect just on the edges of the seams for fishing upstream with classic nymph. Down through the main body of the pool, the current is now much reduced with no speed at all hardly. No good now for fishing North Country spiders. You could have to pinch but I wouldn't do it. I'd change now to dry fly. This is perfect water for dry fly fishing, all the way down through here. And then as you come down, just below me, you can see there's two stones just sticking out of the water. The current picks up again, starts speeding up towards the tail of the pool. Again, you could deploy your spiders wet fly fishing. Below the tail of the pool, as it rushes out, there's a beautiful riffle. Perfect again for fishing upstream classic nymphs and that's where we're going to fish now. It's mid-May here on the River Yore and the yellow maize have started about two or three days ago in earnest which means lots and lots of heptogenid nymphs. May is a perfect time for nymph fishing. We've also still got quite a few large dark olives coming off. 
which means Betis nymphs. So we're going to now fish classic upstream nymphing with casts of two to three rod lengths working in the shallow riffles. Before we start however we've got to make our tackle up. I've got here a brand new seven and a half foot tapered leader down to three pounds at point and onto this I've got, I'm going to put three foot of tippet. First of all though a lot of people have problems when they're confronted with a new leader. They get in all sorts of tangles. The first thing to do is stick the leader in your fingers and put tension on and then just feed the thick end, work on the thick end, feed the thick end round until you unfurl the first few turns and then it's simply a case of unwrapping it against still taut fingers all the way and out she comes. This has got coil memory in it, it's also got a large pear shaped loop in the end which is not streamlined enough for me. I like the loop to be tightly closed and I'm going to show you a very nifty method of doing that. I've got a spoon here, an old spoon, and right in the neck I've rounded it very smooth. And this also gives me something to anchor my hands onto. You'll notice the, too that this has been this loop has been made with a perfection knot. So the main running line, the main leader, is central to the loop. So I'll slip that over, lock my fingers round like that, and then really pull. This is probably 30 pound breaking strain here, so I ain't got the muscles to break this. So really pull, and now you pull like nobody's business. Taking out the coil memory, remember as you go down to not pull as tight, because down here it's only three pound breaking strain. But up here you can really, really lay into it and then this bit where the loop is I'm really going to pull on this so tight as to produce what is the start of a tight hairpin bend and I'm going to close that down what I'm going to use now are my pliers I'm going to nip one side against the other once you've got a purchase on it then just press it closed and there I've got the loop nicely closed. So there is now the loop how I just how I want it. That way when I put it on the minicon it will make the equivalent of what looks like a reef knot which I'm going to do now. I'm going to slide this over Get me line, there's my nice red minicon, remember the drill, it's nylon loop over minicon loop, come down to the end of your leader, thread leader through minicon, pull all the way back until that feeds over and now you feed the knot through so that's the that's the knot you want it should look like a reef knot when it's clinched down and then you can pull tight and there you've got it now I've got to put a tippet length on so I come right to the fine end of my leader but in this height of water there was a, a drop of rain last night it brought the river up a little bit overnight but now it's dropped, but there's still a little bit of water in, a little bit of colour. So I'm deciding to fish with two nymphs today. I'm putting the second nymph on really as a sacrificial nymph, just to get my main nymph down a little bit deeper. What I'm going to use now is a dropper. I'll put a dropper on. That gives me the option of either using the dropper or not using the dropper. So there's the end of my leader. I'm taking off now about three feet of two and a half pound breaking strain mono. 
It's about three feet. So, this is important now to remember that that is going to be my dropper and that is the tip end of my leader. I'm going to use the standard two or three turn water knot and remember don't bring them up together like that. The two pieces have to come in opposite directions like that. Allow about four to four and a half inches of dropper leg. Lay one on top of the other. Moistening them helps, them to, keep, helps to keep them together. And then make a loop. Pull the whole lot through. That's once. That's your first pass. Then through again. Both of them. Slide it through. When you see that situation with the two knots, the two loops unequal, find which one is lagging and pull it up so that they are both the same. That's important. And now simply draw them up, holding all four tags, two tags here, two tags there, draw them up. They'll cross over to make an eight, moisten it. And now, holding all four tags, bear down hard. Remember, all four tags. That's the downstream leg, the one your dropper's going to go on. And that's part of the main, the main leader. That's the upstream tag that you don't want. Slip that over your finger nice and tight. Take your nippers. And nip that as close as one or two millimetres. I have confidence in that knot, so I've left just a little... A little tag there, probably a million and a half. You can trim it even tighter if you want. Check that for length, about three feet. I'll just trim that curly bit off the end. And now I'm ready with my flies. So, it's mid-May and I know that already there's been some yellow maize coming off, so heptagene nymphs are going to be very, very active. There's also lots of bait is still about. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a heptagenid nymph on the point. There's a nice one. Baitish nymph on the dropper. And this again is another little knot exercise. So now I me heptagene it on and I'm using what many people consider the standard knot for tying flies on that's the four turn half blood pull a tag through trap with the little finger and next to the little finger ring finger I suppose go down four times then go back and poke it through the loop I don't need to tuck this, so I only want to pass it through there, trap it against the body, and then just pull through, lubricate it, bit of moisture, bit of spittle, hold the bend, and dry it up. Just give the tag a tug, and that's, that's the fly connected. Now nip off the waist tag. Don't leave it like that. Some people leave tags sticking up. It annoys the hell out of me. Nip that off again to within about two mil. So there is Mr. Heptagenid all ready to go for a little swim. Now we're going to put the Betis nymph on. If that dropper leg is a little bit too long, shorten it. That seems all right, does that? And again, it's exactly the same knot, through the eye, over your fingers, twice, three times, four times, through the, back through the loop. Trap the tag end against your finger, that way you're not wasting so much mono. Draw this up, when it draws up to there, moisten it. 
and pull it all the way. Now you can get hold of the bend of the hook, draw it tight, pull on the tag. Do test that knot. I know lots of people who go fishing and their flies are loose, the knots aren't drawn up, and fish will dry it up and you lose the fish. Two final jobs to do now. One very, very important, and that is to degrease the hole of this leader. We've been holding it with greasy, sticky paws, sweaty paws, so we need to get this sweat residue off the mono. A lot of people go in fishing, wonder why they're not catching fish, and the leader's floating in the film. I use my own concoction, keep it in a 35mm canister. It's a mixture of fuller's earth, glycerine, and fairy liquid. Keep it in this canister, which is airtight, and it won't dry out. Now, rub the entire leader with this, and really, I like to really rub it hard. Go all the way from point fly, up to your dropper, on the dropper leg, and then all the way up the leader, right up to the minicon. And I really work it in quite heavily at this thick butt end because that's the bit that takes the sink in. And the very final job is to make my minicon quite high floating by anointing it with dilly wax. This is a proprietary floatant. Good dob on my finger. Massage that into the minicon just onto the last bit of line there. And that'll hold my fly line high. Stop the tip sinking. Get that away. All we've got to do now is wind in and go fishing. Classic upstream nymphing is not practiced much these days, probably because it demands a lot of hard work. You've got to, A, be not afraid of wading in stream, fast streamy water, and B, it becomes fairly repetitive and busy. You've got to wade upstream, dropping your fly in ahead of you, fan casting, search, search, search. There, 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 and you just work up the run. If you can't figure of eight fast enough, then just simply strip line in. I'm working in towards this other bank, out of this deep slot, where the water is a little bit shallower, and then dropping my nymphs in ahead of me, about two rod lengths away at the moment. Any indication of a take, either my minicon stopping or stabbing forward, I will, I will lift onto it. It's confidence more than anything. Confidence, the right flies, the right tackle. The rod I'm using is eight and a half feet, but eight and a half feet to nine feet. I wouldn't go much above nine feet for classic nymphing. You don't want a rod that's heavy because you've got to be making many, many, many casts still the day. And I've got a heptogenie done at the point and the baitest nymph on the dropper. There's been a lot of yellow mace coming off about half an hour ago, so that shows there's been plenty of nymphal activity. The bottom here is a little bit up and down, so you can't... Oof, that looks like a take. What you will get is you'll get some what look like takes. The line will stab under and it'll be moss that you've caught up on, which in fact was that last one. It's just rubbed past the stone on its travel downstream and your line cheese cuts through the water and you're thinking in business. Dropped it behind a large boulder head. Minicon's nicely floating. You've got to keep an eye on the 
fly line on the Minicon all the time and don't cast further than you can control. It's no use making 15 yard casts. Two rod lengths is ample and then you just simply work upstream, search, search, search. Keep your eye on the Minicon, strike at the end of every drift just in case and work up the riffle. Progress up fairly fast, don't fish slow. Now one of the things that people slip up with is A they don't raise the rod as the fly is drifting back down to them, so compensating for your recovery and B they allow the advancing fly line to go behind them so they don't recover fast enough and they'll let a pulley wheel effect take place like that. Now if you let that happen what you get is the fly being tugged downstream faster than the current so you've got to get your fly going down dead drift and only dead drift. So keep the rod below the point where the fly line leaves the water. Still plenty of water ahead of me to fish. This run's by no means fished out. Strike at anything, don't wait for your brain to tell you that you've had a take on any suspicion, reaction takes over and you lift. Yes, I took late, did that, it was right by my body almost when he stabbed the line. Unmistakable strike though. Come on, sunshine. Go on, go behind that stone. That's it. Come out. Come to your uncle Ollie. That's it. It's taking the help to Jeannie at the point. It's a uh, lethal fly this month and June when the big yellow maze are coming off. There you go. So on your straight back over now. Good chance of another fish or two up here. That fish took right there, right, right late in the drift, which is fairly unusual really. They usually take sort of after two or three, two or three yards. But of course that's a good indication that you have to be on your metal for anywhere down the drift for a fish to take. There's some really broken water ahead of me that suggests a lot of boulders, a lot of rubble underwater and it could be good ambush territory for a trout and there's a calm patch on the bank side of it with like a nice current seam so I'll just let the flies search out this it's a question of searching really you're searching all over the place anywhere where you think there might be a trout line you get that fly through it Still keep going, search with your leading foot, progress up the run. Quite a way to go yet. Yes, an air river fish. Another small trotter. Oh, he's very small, is this one? He's taken bait, his nymph. Get him in as fast as you can. Come on, in you go. So this, this upstream nymph in, in fast water can be very, very rewarding. And days of 20 and 30 fish are very much on the cards. I'm probably fishing this a little bit too slowly through. I should be moving a little bit faster. 
but the bottom is just a little bit awkward to move fast when it's more fine cobbles and gravel you can move a lot faster yeah I can see there's a big stone there I can see it now a really big boulder I'm in no oh, this is a better fish oh that was a good fish well I'm nearly through this now and I think ahead of me I have some very thin water that probably won't hold much in the way of fish you could do it again of course and probably get another two trout or maybe even three but uh, we've probably fished this out now time to look for another place I'm going to tie now a North Country spider wet fly. These are at least 200 years old. The famous trio unquestionably are water hen blower, snipe and purple, and partridge and orange. No one seems to know what they represent, but I think they represent a dun that's been blown over or not quite fully emerged, got its wings all bedraggled, and it's been tossed about by the current. So I'm going to tie now the water hen blower. It's rather a big fly. It's meant to imitate the any stage of the large dark olive. So I've got a size 14 partridge L3A in the vise. The feather to use is the spoon shaped undercovers on a, a water hen's wing. And these are the ones I'm holding up now. And they are dark on one side and like a silvery grey, dark silvery grey on the other side. Take one out and the recipe says the darker side of the feather towards the head of the fly. So all North Country spiders are tied in by the tip of the feather. But don't come to the very tip, otherwise you'll have a breakage. Separate the fibres at about the point where the fibre length is ideal for the size of hook you're tying. I like to enter the feather with the thread so that I don't get that lumpy double tying in start. So I, I offer the feather up, press it against the shank, run some thread off, trap the thread with my finger, bring it over my thumbnail and catch down. So I'm making the thread catch and entering the feather at the same time. After I've made three or four wraps, I can lift the feather tip and the thread up both together and snip off. And now I simply come along with the thread down towards the end of the shank. But remember, North Country spiders are short bodied flies and Tradition has it that the body either finishes opposite the point of the hook or on along to a position halfway between hook point and barb point. I like to tie my flies, my spiders, quite short in the body. So I'm going to leave my thread there. The dubbing is mole and you take off a tiny, tiny amount of dubbing. Most people put enough dubbing on to dress a couple of dozen. All you want is a mere whisper of dubbing, particularly on the blow patterns, it goes on very light. So just mist it along and make sure that it's lightly applied to the thread. Just spread it so that it's just like a, almost like a fog. So I have a mist of dubbing on there and now I dub forward and wind on so that with every turn the dubbing allows the body to shine through. If you're going to run out just nip a little bit more dubbing off 
and just touch it on there. Only wants to be lightly applied. And you can fret the excess off. Now bring your tying thread underneath the hackle to the eye. Hook on my hackle pliers. Make sure that the dark side of the feather is facing the front of the fly. And now wind that on. Once you get the first turn, bring your finger and thumb in front and I just coax the fibers back. And now wrap on. And again, I like to give my spiders two turns of hackle. Then catch through with the thread a couple of times. Some people do think that a North Country spider is only correct if it's got about six hackle barbs sticking out. That's no good at all because a fish will have a fly like that down to a hackleless fly in no time at all. And then come straight round with a two finger whip finish. And I make about three, three turns working back towards the bend. Knit both sides, pull the loop through, slip my fingers out, pull tight, snip off the thread and there is, to my mind, a beautiful fishing fly. When the fly is finished, just apply a tiny touch of head cement just to the head thread wraps. And that's the job done. With this, the snout in purple and the partridge in orange, I would be quite happy to fish in spring from opening day right through to probably middle of June. Spring, of course, is a perfect time to fish North Country spiders. There's lots and lots of nymphal activity. Dunn's been drowned, Dunn's stillborn, so it couldn't be a better time for fishing North Country spiders. I'm going to show you how to make the leader setup, which again is very, very simple. What I've got is the tip part of a seven and a half foot continuous tapered leader, and I cut off about four and a half feet. So the thick end is where this hand is, that's the thick end. There's the fine end, the tip end, which is tapered to about three pound braking strain. To that, I knot on, again using the two-turn water knot, a piece of two and a half pound mono. And I measure off a length of mono that's about nose to tip of finger, and then another length, nose to tip of finger. And then the two droppers are tied on exactly as before with a two-turn water knot. The dropper is always on the downstream leg, so that a fish pulling there is pulling on this part, and a fish pulling on the top dropper is pulling on this part. Then the knot cannot be ripped open, it's very, very secure. On the point, I've got the very famous snipe and purple, middle dropper, the equally famous partridge and orange, and on the top dropper, another very famous fly, the water hen blower. This, some consider, is the famous trio. And I know many, many anglers who wouldn't go fishing in spring without these three on the cast. So, we'll degrease this down near the river, wind in, and let's go fishing. I'm just going to work my way across to the main chute of water. Now you must remember when you're fishing spiders, keep your rod high. 
no rod low to the water. Keep a nice big catenary curve. I've got to just be a little bit careful because I've trees behind me. So I'll have to do almost a roll cast. Keep the rod high. There's been a hatch of pale wateries a little bit earlier, so there should be lots of activity up near the surface. But I'm still a way to go yet before I get to the water that I want to fish. I'm tracking around with the rod, keeping the rod tip high even though it comes down on the dangle. Avoid the temptation to drop your rod at this stage. Still keep a nice deep curve. Yes, there we go. That was a nice steady draw. There's more fish over there. I'm bringing to this side fairly quickly. Come on sunshine, let's have you over. There's a trout. No need to use the net on this fish. Just bring him across. Don't you make a mess of my leader. And don't you splash my glasses either. Well, he's, I've touched him so he's really, really spunky now. Come on, come on, you're only half a pound. Let's have you in. Come on. There we go. So, a nice fish on a North Country spider. A lot of people, of course, fish North Country spiders completely the wrong way. What they do is they make a 45 degree downstream cast, hold the rod low, and some even start figure of eight in the line back like that. Now, I'm not going to say for one minute you're not going to take fish like that because people do catch fish like that but you'll get usually the small stupid fish, uneducated fish but also you'll get a heck of a lot of just sudden pulls at the rod end a lot of missed fish quite simply what these fish are doing they're trying to turn with the fly and the fly because it's on a tight rein is being pulled out of their mouths so if you hold the rod high and you have a nice big soft cushion for the fish to hit then instead of feeling a snatch you'll just feel a rather purposeful draw down a bit more come across cast across mend rod pointing upstream now tracking across my body from right to left what me and my pals call the escalator what we mean by the escalator is where you allow the flies to trundle down at the pace of the current. So you drop the flies over, bring the rod upstream, and now you track round. That's a drifter from there to there. That's about 10 yards drag free. Just check my flies again. There's a fish just moved in this in this current, in this tongue of current behind me. Drop me flies over there. Fish risen to my extreme left. These small flies get get fish quite excited because they hatch in good numbers and it's always quantity rather than quality that excites the fish. Yes! Ha! ha! Here's a fish. Nice little brownie. Only a small fish. And he's given himself the release. I hope this video has fueled your enthusiasm. You've seen two further essential skills. Upstream nymphing 
and wet fly fishing with spiders. But the principles, as always, find the bug, match it, then fish it correctly. One last point, respect the fish, play them quickly, handle them with cold wetted hands and always, always use barbless hooks or crush down the barbs. Mm -hmm.